been so long. It has been. I know it, it took me a, a a long time to get back into a, a good social rhythm after the pandemic. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think I'm even, I'm, I feel like I'm still coming out of that. I mean, honestly, that's part of why I started doing these talks is oh, because I, <laughs> I was like, I need a I need to have some interaction with people, you know, before, like, I have to comment on your earrings because <laughs> before we go any farther, because they're amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Bianca Vega. And uh, she also uh, was the founder of uh, Cinema Nosotros, I think. Yeah. I mean, she had this really great booth at the um, Dallas Contemporary Book Arts Fair. Uh-huh. And this was one of the pairs of earrings that I got from her. She made some really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, those are great. So I thought that maybe we could start with just something to kind of fun. Uh, I mean, not that the whole thing isn't going to be fun, but yeah. uh, you're you're the first person I've gotten to talk to since the eclipse happened. And I oh. know you were also in the path of totality and you shared some photos. And so um, I just found that was my first like total solar eclipse to experience and it was I just thought it was profound and magical and had a lovely time with my family watching it and so I was wondering if you would mind sharing your story and kind of what your experience was with that sure well um Annalise Menjares uh, and Jessica Treviso are over at the Bathhouse Cultural Center and actually, when I started working at the Oak Cliff Cultural Center, I was really excited to um, partner with them mm -hmm. and um, organize a an event for the community. <laughs> so funny. Um, afterwards, I was talking with my husband, Eric, about it. And he was like, what were you thinking? We, you know, we could have all tried to do that together. But I mean, he didn't get off work anyway. But so my experience was actually at work with a large crowd of people from the community uh, at the Bathhouse Culture Center off of White Rock Lake. So it was uh, it was really, really wonderful. Um, Annalise had gotten um, DJ Christy Ray to come out and uh, this ambient music duo, um, Sin Raison. And it was really amazing because um, I don't know, I don't know how it was in San Antonio, but up here it was, it was cloudy. Mm -hmm. And so the sun would peek out through passing clouds every once in a while. So there was this kind of this additional drama to it. And so I would take glimpses with my solar glasses. I, I was safe and we we were making sure that the community had glasses and everything and a lot of people already had glasses it was really wonderful to see people were keeping their eyes safe no one was staring directly at the sun yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and so when it would peek through the clouds I would uh, take little sneak peeks and then um seeing Raison was playing this really beautiful kind of ancestral invoking soundscape that as the clouds parted miraculously yeah. to reveal the total eclipse uh it, it was just a perfect soundtrack and I was I was actually uh standing next to William Saradet so we watched it together it was we were watching right as it was partial 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 and then turned into totality and it was just, it was a beautiful experience. I did yeah. find myself thinking like, oh, I probably should have made sure that we were together. I was with my family because it was really such a, a profound experience. That yeah. was my first time experiencing totality too. Yeah. And I, I really enjoy astronomy I've had since I was really little. In fact, uh, like my favorite gift from childhood was a telescope that my parents got me for Christmas. But another little fun fact that I wanted to talk about with the eclipse was 
the devil comet was right. in, and but the light pollution was was bad in the city so yeah it was too faint for us to see it we could only see uh venus very bright uh, yeah. a little bit under the sun that's cool yeah um i actually even though i was in the path of totality here in san antonio it was only like um one minute and you know 15 seconds or something and my brother lives out farther into the hill country and so i actually went to his house because um I just wanted to experience more of it. You know, he had four minutes and 11 seconds there and he's on a farm. So there's a lot of the animals and I kind of wanted to see how the animals were reacting, which that was a mate. That was really cool. Um, but we, yeah, we also had clouds and it, it did it added to the drama and um, right as it happened, the clouds parted enough, not completely, but, and apparently that's something to do with like the, sudden temperature drop you know that happens but yes. um but even so it was the clouds were so thick that day all over texas i know like in fort worth they they didn't ever have a clear parting um but why, we weren't able to see any of the planets around uh the sun so that's cool that you got to see venus at least and we yeah. had a little we had a little telescope there but we never could like get it pointed right you know um, still learning how to use that, but yeah, no, it can be a challenge. I've, uh, I've taken some pictures with my cell phone through a telescope of the moon mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it's always a challenge. And then uh, with the sun, I mean, you have to make sure that you are, um, putting a protective, um, film across even the camera. And so it's, yeah. so that that other layer of trying right. to line everything up and so right. I, yeah so I and I it. just didn't want to you know I because I've done like some night sky photography and it's very technical and you you do have to be very precise and I just didn't want to mess with any of that I just wanted to experience it you know um and I'm grateful for the people who are really, really into photography to that level that took some beautiful shots. But I knew I, I knew that what I was going to capture wouldn't be at that level and that I would be preoccupied trying to get everything like set up and then just, you know, miss out. So um, I was happy with my choice. <laughs> so understand. Yeah understandable yeah i have noticed that in the past you've done some of your text-based work has been around words like nebula or comet or things like that that are astronomical but i didn't realize that that was a, a really big interest of yours and that's definitely something that we share living in austin there was a a group that was not officially affiliated with ut but they were mostly ut astronomy students that um, put on a program once a month called Astronomy on Tap that was at a local bar. And then they just had different speakers come and talk about whatever their subject area expertise was. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to that like every month for about five years, but it was amazing. And I learned so much and I feel so lucky to have had that available to me. So what is, what is your exposure and interest level in astronomy and like, how has that impacted or, or seeped into your work other than, you know, those, those things that I mentioned so far? Well, the only formal class I can remember taking in astronomy was this college uh, for kids course, like long, long time ago. I think I might've been in middle school or something. And um, from then on, it's, it's mainly just been a study on my own. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the telescope I mentioned earlier came with this huge map of the moon and some other informative posters and things like that. And just a lot of it's just been just my own study. And the 50th anniversary of the moon landing was in 2019. And me, Eric, and Gabriel went down to the Houston Space Center, you know, where Mission Control was. And yeah, it was a really interesting experience. And 
uh, getting all the information about that um, leading up to the moon landing and who all was involved and um, even learning a little bit about the um, conspiracies. Um, right. around, like, Stanley Kubrick was the one who filmed it and, and things like that. And I mean, I, I wrote to film too. So I, it, it's, you know, I, I believe that the we went to the moon. Yeah. But uh, I, I still, um, it's like, yeah, I mean, I could, I could see that. I could yeah. see where, <laughs> I could see where people <laughs> think that Stanley Kubrick actually was the one that filmed it. And, um, oh, Star Date Magazine, we get it in our household and mm -hmm. we read it. I always would listen to Sandy Wood um, when she'd come in, come, come on K-E-O-M back in the day. I, I know she since passed away. Yeah, I, um. I always have just been connected to the cosmos. I think just the beautiful imagery that artists have allowed us uh, to experience the planets with through their renderings of what uh, gets reported back through different types of telescopes, you know, x-rays, wow. not just the telescopes that use a uh, visible light. And also just the concept of thinking about light years and how we got here as human, as a species, like the possibility that meteors came down and then that was a part of the mix of the primordial soup right. that led to even our existence and I, I recently finished reading this book um, Extraterrestrial Languages by mm -hmm. uh, Daniel um, Oberhaus I think I'm saying his name correctly and uh, it's really interesting uh, to read about the connection that a lot of artists have with the cosmos. And um, in particular, there's a chapter in the book called Art as a Universal Language. Oh, wow. And it was really interesting to uh, learn about. In particular, I went down some rabbit holes with this artist named Joe Davis. Uh huh. Do you, uh, have you heard of Joe Davis? No, before? I haven't. This, this was my first time hearing of him too. And um, he he's considered like the grandfather of bio art. Okay. He is, he's still alive and is a, a very important part of the um, scientific exploration at MIT and Harvard. Yeah. And he was involved with uh, one of the transmissions that was sent to try and um, communicate with extraterrestrials that included uh, recordings of vaginal contractions of ballerinas. And when okay. I saw that, that's very was specific, like, <laughs> exactly. It was, yeah. it was in the first paragraph of the chapter of um, okay is the universal language and I was like well I was like uh, was this consensual it was like how would it even <laughs> what what what's happening and so I kind of went down this rabbit hole of uh looking up information on this artist and there's some really good interviews with Joe Davis and there's even a, a short PBS reel where they interview him and um talk about his work and in that it seems that he wanted to be a part of making sure that female genitalia was represented because it had previously been censored out of um, previous uh, transmissions. Okay, yeah. And so I was, it was so funny because the Air Force actually shut down the transmission of these vaginal contractions within either, it was either 20 seconds or 20 minutes. It was like uh -huh. very brief. They did not allow. So they still were like, oh, we don't even want the sounds. <laughs> but do you know what year or basically kind of around the time frame this was? I want to think it was 1980. I mean, I, I really feel like Joe Davis captured, um, what has been um, my connection to the cosmos and art, even though I didn't really, I wasn't consciously wording it in this way. He was, mm -hmm. he was saying that people cannot see themselves. And so the exercise of 
trying to communicate with extraterrestrials or continuing to explore outer space allows us to continue to strive to see ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole point of it. Even if we never get in contact with right. An extraterrestrial. Right. Yeah. Um, I just did a talk with a San Antonio artist, Raul Rene Gonzalez. We talked a little bit about the whole space exploration program and um, the potentiality around it for reshaping how we perceive ourselves just based on what you've been talking about, like depending on what we learn, um, you know, could completely reframe how we see the origins of our species and the impacts that that has across everything you know um because that's such a, a foundational part of our our core being is just the whole you know that giant question of like who are we where did we come from yes. um, and all of the systems and structures that have a, arisen to answer that question and and so on and so forth it's a giant domino game you know um and i think that's something that it's so huge and so still kind of vague that um it's a little bit hard to wrap your brain around and i think it's it's easy to dismiss the uh the importance of like of exploration in order you know to to speak to that particular fundamental part of being human that i think is is something that everyone shares you know exactly. um because of all of the the practicalities of it the you know the money that goes into it which certainly is a teeny tiny percentage of what money is funneled <laughs> towards many, many other things that are, are, in my opinion, much less um, noble of a cause. But, um, you know, it's, it's definitely an argument that people have a, a gain, against the, you know, the whole space program and, and explorations and telescopes and all of that. So, um, I love it when there's conversation like this around it. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, sadly, well, I, I don't know if I should say sadly, I don't know if I should assign any, um, type of sentiment to it, but, um, you know, space exploration definitely came out of the war machine. Right. Yeah. And so all of, all of that's, uh, connected. So it, it you know, it's, it's it's very uncomfortable. That's it very is. uncomfortable. It's very complex. And um so it's uh the human condition of of having all of these um these struggles just intertwined and inextricably linked to each other to right. yeah, to have to have to um go through these experiences to yes yeah, just uh try and get closer to being able to see ourselves and um right yeah it's just it's yes. hard <laughs> i think in general as a species we turn we tend to learn through messiness and yeah. um you know painting ourselves into a corner in a lot of ways and then having to find our way out of that corner. Um, <laughs> it's uh, a very simple metaphor, but I feel like that applies to a lot of things. <laughs> totally. I mean, and these days we're, we're really pushing it. Like, oh yeah, see, we are. Yeah, let's see how close we can get to the brink before right. we <laughs> can figure right. it out. It's uh, humans. Yeah. <laughs> um, humans gonna human. I mean, I, I, it is really easy to, uh, to get into a place of despair, uh, in, around all of that and stuff. But I, I do in general have a sense of, of hope 
in about the direction we're going as as and and I know that it's like there's probably people out there that will hear me say that that are just like are you not paying attention you know but I I am paying attention and I'm appalled and um there's a lot of really horrifying stuff going on but at the same time I think the response the broader response of people is so different than how it has been in the past when similar things have happened that yeah. that to me is hopeful that like that the the conversations and the responses are changing even while there's like a very strong backlash occurring you know i agree and that's that's and that's why the black backlash is so strong yeah. because yeah. Um, there are narratives that are def that in the past have been won by certain entities and they're definitely losing that narrative now yeah and um it it's really yeah it, it gives me hope too i mean i was just talking to eric um yesterday i'm like i i come from ancestors that have in in their time been in these situations right. in these fascist situations in these um these situations that um were unbearable and i'm here because they made a way out of no way. And so I, I agree with you. I, I have that hope. I have that hope that, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll pull it together somehow. And, and the double-edged sword of um, technology and social media and all of that is, you know, on the, on the uh, beneficial side of that is you know, this is the first time that things like this have been occurring in the world where um, people can see what's going on in real time. And, you know, there's a lot that's being obscured, I'm sure, that oh, yeah. we're not seeing, but um, but we are seeing a lot. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm, I am directly hearing people in my lives that haven't had a history of really paying attention or um, just being involved, suddenly being extremely vocal and in a way that I think is very meaningful. Just from my standpoint of observing, it's notable to me that whereas I have been the squeaky wheel <laughs> for a very long time and that's been uncomfortable, like all of a sudden the, the wheels that were just like running smoothly are getting real squeaky too. And, um, and so, yeah, that's part of, that's part of that, uh, hopefulness, I think just noticing people changing. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And on that note, kind of just like shifting gears a little bit back to art. <laughs> I listened to your, your glass tire talk with, uh, William Saradet. Um, I had listened to it when it came out and then I re-listened to it just to refresh my memory before we talked. And one of the things that you talked about with the Oak Cliff Community Center was the um, the sense of community and uh, wanting to create an avenue that puts money into artists' hands. And um, so I wondered if you might kind of speak to that a little bit. And and some time has passed since you had that conversation with him, and so. Uh, and I think you've been in that position now for a, a, like a little over a year, right? Um, so what's going on there? How's that evolving? And how's that like meeting that core um, thing that you wanted to accomplish as far as community goes? Well, I definitely feel like um, I've been able to accomplish what I've wanted to do. And, um, you know, but there are budgets. So, mm -hmm. you know, not nearly to the extent that I would want to, but, um, you know, in, in the small way, um, given the budget constraints that, um, I have access to, um, I've been able to do that. And, um, and also I've, um, really, come to understand the importance of being able to offer space too. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, just the, the 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 importance of being able to offer space for um, a variety of artists of different um, genre expressions to be able to have space to share their work. Yeah, that's great and extremely necessary. I think. Um, I mean, uh, it's a diff different context, but I think that the awareness of how precious physical space is to to do your work has been very much at the forefront of my practice for the past several years because I haven't really had that. Um, and I'm just now moving into a studio space at my aunt's house that she has a, a loft that she was not using in this really cool like split level 1970s house that I always loved as a kid. And it's really fun to go over there because it kind of also triggers this like inner child thing. But um, yeah, As I've been sort of setting up over there. It's really sinking into me how transformative that's going to be for me to just be able to do work. And so I think the fact that you're, um, you're facilitating that for others is like in, in a really incredible thing, you know? We definitely need that in the world. Well, yeah. And I mean, something you just said too, um, it kind of made me think about the importance of having space to play and having space to connect with other people mm -hmm. um, in person and um, just uh, really solidifying those um, interpersonal, interpersonal bonds with one another. And um, that's the other thing in this position. Um, I definitely um, am excited about the potential of my own growth in improving um, my communication with people and um, uh, and also observing the just immensely just a uh, holistic and profoundly wonderful leadership style of uh, my manager, Rafael Tamayo, and also my uh, wonderful friend and colleague, Iris Bechtel. Uh, I came on um, with uh, the two of them already, um, you know, holding it down and doing a fantastic job uh, at the Oak Cliff Cultural Center. And so I just, I feel really fortunate working with the two of them mm -hmm. and to be able to um, really watch how they um, engage with the community and um, the things that they were already doing well before I got there. Yeah, to, to uh, be able to work with those two and continue to not only try to bring some things to the table myself, but also just really observe and um, um, try to gain some knowledge from these two really great people that I work with. And I mean, I, I'm just talking about within the confines of the Oak Cliff Cultural Center. I mean, I, I also have really wonderful colleagues at um, the other cultural centers, Bathhouse Cultural Center. I mentioned Jessica Treviso, the manager over there, and Annalise Minjares, uh, my counterpart at Bathhouse, also Enrique is over there, and over at South Dallas Cultural Center. Carla Barthel, me, she's my counterpart over at South Dallas. She's, uh, she's also amazing. Um, let me think, Denarian Dupree, uh, he's uh, uh, marketing at South Dallas, the manager, John Spriggins, uh, he's, you know, uh, giving me wonderful opportunity to have a show uh, before I started working mm -hmm. at the cultural center over at the south dallas cultural center the latino cultural center gerardo robles the manager over there and just a, a wonderful team that he has working with him over at the latino cultural center it's amazing and then we have martin philippe is the fairly new director she came on a few months before i started so she's been there uh about almost two years and so i i feel re really fortunate too to have come on into the um um, Office of Arts and Culture of Dallas at the time that I did, because I feel, I just feel like it's, um, yeah, there's some really great opportunities to, 
engage with the community and um, support artists in what they want to see happen in the city. And I feel like just listening to you um, mention all of those people and the different programs um, and honoring those people by, you know, by name and position and their role and, and contributions, um, you know, that's an important thing because it, it really, it's the whole, you know, it takes the village and you as a person who recognizes that and who takes the care to, um, to know people, to know their names, to know their roles, and then to share that and make that known seems to me that you're kind of in a perfect position, um, as someone with that level of, of consciousness to, um, to recognize that it's, you know, your place in a whole and in a community. So um, kudos to you for that. Um, well, <laughs> I, 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 mean, really I thank you. I mean, I, I, um, yeah, I, I just really feel fortunate to be able to work in collective with um, just such an amazing group of people. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I want to, I do want to make sure that I remember that, but, and, you know, uh, to touch base on, uh, some of the things we're talking about a little bit earlier. I mean, uh, you know, one never wants to get into a mindset where they're feeling like, well, I need to take this all on my shoulders by myself. And right. I mean, that's, that's, that's not realistic thinking anyway. How does that translate to your personal artistic practice? Because I know like, you know, for me personally, there's, I, I kind of require a certain level of solitude in order to really get into my headspace to allow things to come out. Um, and then there's, there's parts where I do want to talk about it more and be a little more collaborative, but that comes later you know, and everybody has their own, their own way of working. And how does that, how does that translate for you? That sense of community versus solitude? Well, it definitely, um, it's been a challenge. Uh, I was at the book doctor for almost 10 years. So yeah, shout out to Candace McKay and Brian Jones and Jessica Sinks. And so it was a major adjustment coming on into this position that is front facing and um, requires a lot of administrative work. Um, so I'm using my brain in a lot of different ways. And I, I um, referring back to the interview with William, um, I remember telling him that I was going to take a year to get my sea legs in my position and then um, try to double dutch my visual art practice back in because mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew that it was going to be um, a, a really, um, it was going to take a lot of adjustment. Um, this being a, a cultural worker definitely takes up, uh, emotional real estate, uh, physical real estate, um, mental real estate, all the types of uh, capacities you can think of. So, uh, it can be difficult to find the solitude that is necessary, mm -hmm. um, I'm very fortunate to have a home studio. We, we have a detached garage. So I'm fortunate to be able to work in a detached studio, although sometimes, uh, to be honest, our dining, our dining room table also turns into yeah. <laughs> a workspace, uh, to, much to the chagrin of, of my family. But it can definitely be a challenge to find that solitude that is a necessary mm -hmm. uh, part of um, getting my getting bringing my work to fruition. Yeah. Uh, I and. In my process, I go through uh, a season of 
information gathering like i was just telling you i finished reading the extraterrestrial languages i was also reading this book africa counts and a lot of the information out of those books has a has a, a an insulation body of work uh coming to mind for me so i'm going to be working on some things here in the next few months. And that's usually how I'll do it is like information gathering, uh, even taking some classes to mm -hmm. pick up uh, some skills that I want to hone or uh, contacting um, artists to collaborate on um, on parts of uh, the work that maybe I'm like, oh, no, if I try to do that, that's it's not yeah. it's not gonna, it's not gonna be how I want it uh so I'll take that time to do uh those things as well um and uh actually I'm working on a collaborative project with my friend artist Elisa Banks and um she told me about this um scholarship um for a printmaking course out of print houston but um it was a, a scholarship specifically to take a printmaking class and i applied for the scholarship and i got it and so i was able to take a printmaking class at flatbed press it was a two-day course a samantha artist samantha melvin taught the course and i just had a blast learning the processes of monotype i had never done it before and it's really i feel like it's going to open up some possibilities for you know adding some more color to my work and i i really enjoyed the immediacy of that printmaking process there's not so many solvents and different types of equipment it, it's right. it's kind of stripped down form of printmaking so I really enjoyed it I feel like that sometimes when you step away from your art practice whether it's by choice or circumstance um and then you return with this new set of experiences um maybe some more exploration into just technical things or, you know, whatever it is, it, it, it acts as a refresh, you know, and adds value. And I think that we have, um, you know, in our culture of productivity, there's such a pressure on artists to always be producing and always be sharing and always be visible and, um, and that really gets in the way sometimes of that, uh, of the value of just stepping away. And I think it's probably, I mean, just hearing you talk, I'm kind of getting excited about like what, what's coming for you, because it feels like that this time has been a very expansive uh, growth period for you in a lot of ways. I mean, I know that your calligraphy and text-based art has really kind of been at the core of mm -hmm. everything you do. Do you have any ideas at this point of how like printmaking may become integrated with that? Or are you still just sort of in a play stage? I, I am still sort of in a play stage with it uh, because uh, Samantha and I were discussing that and um Lately, I've been really attracted to using the round hand uh, script that was um, brought over to the Americas from Britain, and it it, it really fits into into my work uh, mm -hmm. with my mom being from Jamaica um, and Britain being the uh, main colonizer, not the only colonizer, but the main colonizer of uh, Jamaica. Um, a lot of my work um, has to do with that. We were talking about having to not only reverse the script, but uh, like the letters themselves, but also the slant and um, uh, all, of these, all of these different aspects of it in order to be able to print them. And so... Uh, I, there's definitely a lot more play that I need to do. Yeah. With script. But just hearing you talk about that, how the particular styles of calligraphy that you've chosen to use are connected to colonialism and just kind of intuitively or whatever it is, you know, that's something that I feel like when I've looked at your work and as, as much as that, that period is just like 
soaked into everything in our culture, that's the first association that comes to mind. It's just like, I mean, calligraphy has existed for, you know, thousands of years across cultures, but the the particular styles that you're using, that's those, those are the visuals that are in my head is that time period. And, mm -hmm. um, and then just knowing kind of who you are and the, the, the content that you tend to work with and um, the word choices that you're using, um, it all kind of fits together. And then what you just said about having to like um, reverse the type and adjust the slant and these little, little details, it's like adopting, you know, by choice, whereas in the past, that was a forced thing to adopt this language and this uh, writing and all of that. Um, and, and you're doing these like very subtle subversive things to them that kind of call attention to it. Um, and I love those, I love that level of subtlety, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's part of why I've, I've been attracted to your work. Um, and I, you know, also I do writing and things like that. So text-based art also appeals to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I have been, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of a little bit all over the place, but I'm going to bring it together. Okay. Um, I've been working on scheduling the next round of people to talk to. And Ray, Ray Mel Cornelius is one of the people and I told him that he might be following yours. And he was just like, oh no, the pressure, she's so smart. And, <laughs> and I was like, she is, yes, definitely. And I, and I think that um, there is a, a quality about your work that's so, it's very conceptual, it's very precise, um, thoughtful, um, but there's like a real heart to it as well it's definitely like it's not like a cold intellectual process um and a conscientiousness that you know it just kind of feels like the total package in a lot of ways um so I just I wanted to share that with you that like his impression and my impression and um and that you have a warmth about you you know like when we've we've interacted at galleries very briefly like I've always appreciated that about you so um in the spirit of of sharing things that we don't always say to people I'll just say that to you but oh, um thank you that means that means so much as I <laughs> yes yeah, just thank you and that, that means a lot thank you for those kind words yeah um Thank you for all of, all that you're doing. It sounds like we're wrapping it up, but yeah, to go back to the point about you using these very subtle subversive tactics or tactics might not be the right word, but it fits. So um, to, to call attention to colonialism and its continued presence in our culture and our, our world, um, I think is really powerful. Um, do you, how much of that is conscious for you and how much of it do you feel like is kind of just intuitive and uh, when you're planning, I mean, it's so minimal. A lot of your work is so minimal and pared down to its essence. It seems like there's a lot of decision-making going into the process for you. Yes, like I mentioned before, definitely there's a lot of research that happens beforehand and um so um i it's hard for me to it's hard for me to say how much of it's intuitive and how much of it is um um a deliberate decision an intentional decision um because i feel like it i, I feel like it comes in and out and sometimes it's simultaneously being done because um, there have been times where I have completed like uh, large swaths of different series and I hadn't quite finished reading the source material that I wanted to. And then I will discover something later that 
I had already um, drawn out and it fits perfectly with the research um, that I had to do after the fact. It was like, right. oh yeah, no, I was um, going in the right direction with this. And um, I, I definitely am uh, acting in the Black or African American tradition of self education um, historically. And, um, you know, as I uh, have mentioned many times before, my mom being from Jamaica, my dad being from Louisiana, the there's a, a lot of information about the um, separation or the distancing of um, my history from my ancestors from myself and so um even as I gain the information and kind of piece it together I'm I'm making it into a, a new thing it's never going to be what it, it was in the past and mm -hmm. that's fine it's something new and it's something that has even more strength I think to um build upon and uh, be a part of uh, the future so it, it's it also is afro futuristic in a way and so um I know that there's no way that I would be able to um like grip all of that and and that's that's beautiful too like mm -hmm. the, the work uh it has a life of its own. And then um, hearing the interpretations from other people who are experiencing the work adds another layer to that. And I, I just, I really love all of it. <laughs> I've, been, I've been telling a few people that I um, I started these improv classes. Uh-huh. Matter of fact, uh, that's what I'm going to, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to head to improv class right after this. Um, uh, and I, I feel like, uh, it's helping me, um, in so many different, um, aspects of my life. And, um, I'm excited about that, including my, uh, visual arts practice and my, uh, ability to just, you know, be comf comfortable with sometimes how awkward I can be in, in communicating uh, verbally and um, yeah, just, just enjoying uh, the play with people verbally mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and in body language and everything. So, yeah. Um, I love that. I mean, I, I'm just a huge proponent of getting outside of your, your comfort zone and trying something totally new and unrelated. And then it ends up being related. And, yeah. um, I mean, I don't know you very well. And my impression of you mostly is through your work and then the, the few interactions that we've had, but, um, you know, like your work does have that, that very precise quality to it. And um, I mean, just the art of calligraphy in and of itself is an art of precision and care, and it's not spontaneous. And yeah. so like the, I, the idea of you taking an improv class, which is all about spontaneity and looseness, um, it's like, it's almost like polar, you know, opposites ends of the spectrum and yeah. um that's kind of exciting to see how that will shape things for you. And how long have you been doing that? Uh, I just started earlier this year. So let's see, I'm on my third improv class. So just like almost, almost four or five months. Yeah. And yeah, no, exactly what you're saying. Just um, because um, I feel like perfectionism and um you know not wanting to make mistakes is it's it's um one of my biggest challenges yeah and it's like no it's okay 
Yeah. <laughs> In fact, sometimes it's hilarious. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if you continue doing that, uh, I look forward to a future performance, you know, if that's something that you choose to do. Uh, um, yeah, I feel maybe like later, maybe later I'll subject yeah. my and loved ones. <laughs> 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 right now, my God. I, I completely I, understand and appreciate that. I mean, to my horrible improv, but go ahead. <laughs> I, know, I was just saying that, like, I feel like you've done a lot of um, public speaking, or at least I've seen a lot of videos of you doing public speaking um, with the art groups that you're with or uh, whatever. And so there's a certain level of comfort, but I feel like from my experience, like, you know, back when I had a corporate job, I had to do a lot of presenting and speaking in front of groups. And I felt, I feel like I was very good at that, but I also, it was so impersonal, you know, and it was like, here's my thing. I've worked really hard at this. I know it. I'm going to present it, you know, great. I can speak to it. But then all of a sudden, like that, that level of vulnerability that comes from performance you know, yes. whether it's comedy or drama or whatever, like to me, that's like the most terrifying thing is like stage getting on a stage and just performing and like, you know, much respect to the people who do that. Um, but Same. I can see that it would be really powerful in, in building just like a level of self-confidence and um all kinds of other things that you probably can't predict you know exactly because like um I definitely feel that uh I've been able to prepare to talk mm -hmm. but it's the the more on the fly um uh just pulling from past experiences or you know just just being and not yeah. not be like okay stiffen up you're right. you need to be on guard that kind of yeah right. I want to of, um a little bit of that yeah yeah and um you know you've mentioned research several times and that's something that I do as well and um you know, even in what I was just saying about like doing presentations for work, it's like, I know the material. And so I'm confident, I'm comfortable in that, in that, in that knowing. Um, and I remember there was that Netflix Brene Brown special that came oh. out like around 2017 ish, maybe. Um, mm. And she, one of the things that she said in that, that were like really, really stuck out to me was that she in her history has um, a pattern of using um, and she used the term academic armor mm. as shield to to protect herself you know her vulnerable self and I just was like yes. <laughs> like it just made my head explode I was just like oh <laughs> that's what I've been doing you know yeah um, yeah go ahead yeah yeah um academic armor right and I think a lot I mean the the research aspect is like I enjoy learning and I think you probably do too like it's you just enjoy like expanding your yourself in that way and so part of a lot of it is for the pleasure of it but there is probably you know an element of like um making sure everything is shored up and yes. so it's impenetrable so that when the critics come because they will come they always do no matter what that you can you can stand your ground that's it yeah that's it. Um, no, and as as women and then you know um some of the intersectional things that happen um i think that could be a go-to for us too yeah yeah. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I mean, I've kind of, um, I feel like my, my, uh, 
practice, my artistic practice feel may from the outside feel a little, you know, schizophrenic in a way, like multiple personalities go. I know those are different things and apologies. I don't mean to like, it's probably not a great metaphor to use, but, um, you know, there's, they're, they're like a, a totally different headspace that I'm in, but I kind of need to have that level of category categorization. And some of it is just like to be completely loose and, um, and unplanned. And yeah. I have to have, I have to be able to do that over here in order to not be completely rigid over here if that makes sense, you know, it totally does. That's, yeah. that's it. That yes, that's yeah. exactly what I'm trying to work on. And, and it, and it is something that take. it's something that takes an effort. It's not something that, you know, yeah, you can just wake up and go, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be spontaneous with right. that. <laughs> it's a, it's I'm gonna, a, I'm gonna decide to be spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that no. doesn't work. Um, and, I, and just to go back to uh, your use of the word schizophrenic, I recently looked it up because I was uh, having the same like, oh, I don't know, is this problematic? And no, it's a it's a perfectly acceptable. It's the second tier definition, but you are using that word correctly okay. outside of the um, mental diagnosis. So. Okay. All right. I mean, I just, it's, it's, it's an area of mental, mental health where I feel like we're still shifting our, our narratives and our conversations. Um, and, and too often it's been used as a derogatory dismissive, you know, uh, turn of phrase. I guess mm -hmm. no, I get it. So, I get it. That's why I've I've um replaced yeah. the word crazy with a constitutional carry. That's why I, there that's you go. It's <laughs> like that's so constitutional carry. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you. It's it's wonderful to talk with you again because yeah, it's been it's been so long. So I I love um. This project has been so rewarding for me on so many levels, but like at its core, I get to have these one-on-one -on -one and in-depth conversations with really cool people. And some of it's reconnecting to people from my past. And some of it's just like getting to know people that I've wanted to get to know. And you're definitely in that core category. And then some, there's been a few people who they're just brand, we're brand new to each other. And, um, and I'm trying to kind of keep a mix there. Um, but I really appreciate that you you took the time to talk with me. It means a lot. And um, and I look forward to more.